trying to do something memorable. They were trying to throw a long ball. Break it down. But, what, but, what didn't so, work? Well, first of all, it, it, it just it didn't feel very – you didn't want to watch. I mean, you didn't want to Professor lean Richard in. H. Clarida, the new vice chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System of the United States, for a speech, his first speech in his new office. We're very proud to have Rich with us today. Um, we're going to be talking about the economic outlook and monetary policy, the core – purposes of the Federal Reserve in many ways, the core purposes of Professor Clarida's role as vice chair of the FOMC. Um, as we're in World Series season and the Red Sox are up 2-0, um, I will note that what one always tries to find if you're doing a fantasy draft is someone who's a triple threat, who can hit, field, and run. Uh, Rich Clarida is such a triple threat in monetary economics. He's someone who, of course, has had an eminent academic career, joining the faculty at Columbia University in 1988 after getting his PhD from Harvard and serving there for 30 years until this appointment, including as chairman of the Department of Economics. Many of you remember his work in various aspects, including making ve vector autoregressions work out as Taylor rules, which then was applied in fascinating ways to the viability of the euro area. He's one of the most cited economists in the world, academically speaking. He's also, of course, been at the core of policy, formally as Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Economic Policy in 2002 and 2003. We were just reminiscing about him coming when this building first opened and he had just come down to join the Paul O'Neill Treasury, Bush Treasury at that time. Um, but of course, he's been a consultant and advisor formally and informally to the Fed, the U.S. government, numerous central banks around the world it's before and since. And to round out the triple threat, he has, of course, been global strategic advisor with PIMCO and then managing director with PIMCO from 2006 until this year. Um, it's very rare, even in the rarefied heights of the Fed, to get someone so talented. We had that in Rich's predecessor, Stanley Fisher, as the vice chair for monetary policy, who is now, of course, a member of the Peterson Institute's board. We are fortunate in the U.S. to have that again in the form of Rich Clarida. So we are on the clock. There is now a speech that has been released from embargo that is available on the Fed website, linked to on our website. But we will importantly hear the words directly from Vice Chairman Clarida's mouth. Rich. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, I brought the good weather with me, so let's get off to a good start there. Adam, thank you so very much for that introduction. I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience today, and I'm delighted to be at the Peterson Institute to offer my first public remarks after being sworn in as Vice Chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. As some of you know, I've been a student of U.S. monetary policy for 30 years. And so for me personally, it is a distinct honor and real privilege to have the opportunity to serve with my colleagues on the Board of Governors and along with the Reserve Bank presidents on the Federal Open Market Committee. Now, I, of course, fully realize that I have participated in just one FOMC meeting to date. And so my remarks will not come with the patina earned from long experience as a monetary policymaker. That said, I thought it might be of interest to share with you my thinking on the current state of the U.S. economy to explain how it informed my support for the FOMC's policy decision last month and to discuss my views on the way forward for U.S. monetary policy. Let's begin by thinking about the U.S. economic expansion. The U.S. economic expansion is now in its 10th year and is marked by strong growth in GDP and a job market that has been surprising on the upside for nearly two years. It is impossible today to know with much precision 
how much of the pickup in growth and the decline in unemployment that we have seen over the past two years is structural and how much is cyclical. Most likely both factors are at work. That said, based on my reading of the accumulating evidence, I believe that trend growth in the economy may well be faster and the structural rate of unemployment lower than I would have thought several years ago. Let me elaborate. First, let's look at the demand side of the economy. Consider the recent benchmark revisions to the household savings rate. Recently revised Commerce Department data now show that aggregate household saving rate is running at 6.7% of disposable income. This revised estimate is nearly double the previous estimate. The higher level of saving suggests to me that in contrast to the previous economic expansion, when households were borrowing to maintain consumption while income growth slows, households today, at least in the aggregate, are well positioned to maintain or even increase consumption gains relative to income. So to me, at this stage in the business cycle, a historically high household savings rate is a tailwind for the economy, not a headwind. And of course, recent reductions in personal income tax rates are also a tailwind for the economy. Productivity and investment data provide another vantage point from which to assess both the demand and the supply sides of the current expansion. Over the past few years, we have seen some pickup in productivity growth, albeit from a very depressed pace. By contrast, at a comparable stage in both the 01 to 07 and the 82 to 90 economic expansions, productivity growth was actually slowing relative to its contemporaneous peak to present pace. I should also note that this recent pickup in productivity has coincided with a rebound in business investment and that this increase in capital spending has been evident in both the equipment and intellectual property categories. It is not just an oil patch story. Business investment is being supported by recent changes in the tax code that lower the cost of capital, as well as by continued strong profitability of U.S. companies. Now, while capital investment is one important source of productivity growth, and recent data on this front are encouraging, Predicting future or even identifying past inflection points in productivity growth is notoriously difficult. Although it may be tempting to simply extrapolate a decade of disappointing productivity data into a distant future, a pickup in trend productivity growth is a possibility that deserves close monitoring. Let me now turn to the job market and the inflation outlook. Average monthly job gains continue to outpace the increase needed to provide jobs for new entrants to the labor force over the longer run. At 3.7% in September, the unemployment rate has not been this low since 1969. In addition, after remaining stubbornly sluggish throughout much of the expansion, wage growth is at last picking up. A sustained rise in inflation-adjusted or real wages at or perhaps above the pace of productivity growth is typical in an economy operating in the vicinity of full employment. And we are starting to see some evidence of this. I certainly hope it continues. Now some might see a rise in wages as leading to upside inflationary pressures, but here again, the experience of earlier cycles is instructive. In the past two US expansions, gains in real wages in excess of productivity growth were not accompanied by a material rise in price inflation. Of course, this time may be different, and as with growth, the job market could perform better or worse than a baseline outlook. However, for now, the increase in wages has been broadly consistent with the pickup in productivity growth that I have discussed, and a rise in the still low rate of labor force participation, especially among the prime age population, provides scope for the job market to strengthen further without generating inflationary pressures. The outlook for the labor market also reflects my view that the structural or longer run rate of unemployment, that is the unemployment rate consistent with stable inflation over the longer run, may be somewhat lower than I would have thought several years ago. What this means is that even with today's very low unemployment rate, the labor market might not be as tight 
and inflationary pressure is not as strong as I once would have thought. I am certainly not alone in this thinking. Over the past several years, the FOMC participants have been reducing their individual estimates of the longer run level of the unemployment rate. For example, the median estimate of the FOMC participants fell from around 5.5% five years ago to 4.5% in the projections published last month. Outside estimates, such as those from the Congressional Budget Office and the Blue Chip Economic Indicator Survey, show a similar pattern of downward revision. This makes sense, with unemployment falling and wage gains thus far in line with productivity and expected inflation, the traditional indicators of cost push price pressures, pressures are not flashing red right now. Both total and core personal consumption expenditure inflation are now running close to the FOMC's 2% objective. When, when thinking about the inflation outlook, I myself pay attention to market-based measures of inflation compensation from the TIPS market, as well as to surveys of inflation expectations. So-called break-even inflation rates are simply the difference between yields on traditional treasury securities and those on inflation-protected securities with comparable maturities. While these market-based measures are not perfect and do need to be adjusted for liquidity and term premium factors, they can provide a useful signal about market inflation expectations, which can be combined with signals from surveys of expected inflation to get a read on inflation expectations. Break-even inflation rates have only recently risen to a range that is in line, but just barely, with the expectation that inflation will remain close to the Fed's 2% inflation goal over the medium to longer run. Survey-based measures of inflation expectations also appear consistent with the Fed's inflation goal. In short, the labor market today is robust and inflation is at or close to the Fed's 2% inflation goal. Thus, the economy is as near as it has been in a decade to meeting both of the Fed's dual mandate objectives, which suggests to me that monetary policy at this stage in the economic expansion should be aimed at sustaining growth and employment at levels consistent with keeping inflation at or close to the 2% rate with, consistent with price stability. By contrast, until this year, the appropriate focus of, focus of policy had been to return employment and inflation to levels consistent with the Fed's dual mandate objectives. With the economy now operating at or close to mandate consistent levels for inflation and unemployment, the risks that monetary policy must balance are now more symmetric and less skewed to the downside. I supported the FOMC's decision last month to raise the target range for the federal funds rate to a range of two to two and a quarter percent. With the economy growing briskly, the labor market operating in the vicinity of full employment, and inflation running close to two percent, I saw our decision as another step in removing the extraordinary degree of accommodation put in place in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. However, even after our September decision, I believe that U.S. monetary policy remains accommodative. The funds rate is just now, for the first time in a decade, above the Fed's inflation objective. But the inflation-adjusted real funds rate remains below the range of estimates for the longer-run neutral real rate, often referred to as R star, that are computed from the projections submitted by the board members and reserve bank presidents. This longer run R star, like the natural rate of unemployment, is both unobserved and time varying, and thus must be inferred as a signal extracted from noisy macro and financial data. That said, and notwithstanding the imprecision with which R star is estimated, it remains to me a relevant consideration as I assess the current stance and best path, path forward for monetary policy. The reason for this is because as Milton Friedman argued in his classic American Economic Association presidential address, a central bank that seeks to consistently keep real interest rates below our star will eventually face rising inflationary pressure and inflation expectations, while a central bank that seeks to keep real interest rates above our star will eventually face falling inflation and inflation expectations. My own research and others' research suggests that the failure of the Fed to respect this principle 
contributed to the great inflation of the 1970s. While the incorporation of this principle into Fed policy in the 90s and the 2000s contributed to the achievement of stable and low inflation during and since those years. And so, even though estimates of R star are imprecise, I do not believe they should be ignored. Instead, when thinking about monetary policy, I believe it is best not to ignore entirely an admittedly imprecise estimate of R star today, but instead to update that estimate as new data on inflation, inflation expectations, employment, growth, and productivity arrive. Moreover, because monetary policy operates with a lag, and with inflation presently clo close to the 2% goal, it will be especially important to monitor inflation expectations closely, using both surveys and financial market data, to best calibrate the pace and destination for policy normalization. It will also be important to monitor both model-based and financial market-based estimates of the expected future real interest rate, for example, using data from the inflation indexed uh, securities market, suitably adjusted, of course, for term premium and liquidity effects as one indicator of this longer run R star. Before the financial crisis, such five-year real rates five years forward averaged around 2% after a term premium adjustment. Since 2015, they've averaged about one half of 1% in real terms, but recently have approached three quarters of 1%. Given that the real interest rates and economic growth tend to move together over the longer run, one possible source of these upward revisions in forward real rates in recent months could be that financial market participants have become more optimistic about the growth potential of the economy. Evidence also suggests that the term premium that investors require to hold longer maturity bonds has risen as well. If the data come in as I expect, I believe that some further gradual adjustment in the federal funds rate will be appropriate. As I mentioned earlier, I believe monetary policy today remains accommodative and that with the economy now operating at or close to mandate consistent levels for inflation and unemployment, the risks that monetary policy must balance are now more symmetric and less skewed to the downside. Raising rates too quickly could unnecessarily shorten the economic expansion while moving too slowly could result in rising inflation and inflation expectations down the road that could be costly to reverse. As I calibrate in the months ahead the pace and ultimate destination for monetary policy adjustments that will best allow the Fed to achieve its dual mandate objectives, it will be important to me to evaluate a wide range of economic and financial market indicators to complement the predictions yielded by model-based scenarios. As I look ahead, if strong growth, robust employment gains were to continue and were to be accompanied by a material rise in actual and expected inflation, that circumstance would indicate to me that additional policy normalization might well be required beyond what I currently expect. By contrast, if strong growth and employment gains were to continue and to be accompanied by stable inflation, inflation expectations, that situation to me would argue against raising the short-term interest rates by more than I currently expect. In conclusion, with the economy operating as close as it has in a decade to the Federal Reserve's dual mandate objectives for price stability and maximum employment, I believe monetary policy at this stage of the economic expansion should be aimed at sustaining growth and maximum employment at levels consistent with keeping inflation at or close to 2%. Even after our most recent policy decision, the monetary policy remains accommodative, and I believe some further gradual adjustment in the policy rate will likely be appropriate. That said, at this stage of the business cycle, I believe it will be especially important to monitor a wide range of data to continually assess and calibrate the level of the policy rate that is consistent with meeting our dual mandate objectives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vice Chair. Clarida, you are off with a bang. Um, 
as is often the case when speaking to central bank officials, this is going to be on the record, but I will be posing some questions for the vice chair, and this will not be opened up to the audience. Um, thank you for your understanding. And as I'm sure you all realize, many of these questions came out of the wisdom of my colleagues here at the Peterson Institute. Can I start by just following up directly on some of your remarks about the labor market yeah. conditions? I, I think it was really helpful for you to remind people that in the past two recoveries, I can read the quote, um, in the past two U.S. expansions, gains in real wages and excess of productivity growth were not accompanied by a material rise in price inflation. So one way of reading what you said is that, I think you said, but, I, but certainly one way of reading what you said is there aren't necessarily any alarm buttons going off based on labor market data alone. Not to me right now, today, right. yeah. So at what point do you use labor market conditions to update your estimate of R star? Because it sounded like you were saying, notwithstanding labor market conditions, I think we have to make our best guess on R star and we're accommodative. But do you ever use the lack of wage inflation or the possibility of real wage growth to update your views on R star? Adam, the way I think about it is um, I, would, I would use wage data and a wide range of other data to, to think about the expectations for, for price inflation. Um, as I argued, historically, there's not a simple mechanical textbook link right. between wages and price inflation. You know, a little editorial comment, the original Phillips paper was about wages and right. unemployment, not necessarily prices and unemployment. And the Fed's mandate is, is price stability for a consumer price index. So, so I would use a wide range of data to update my views about future price inflation. So in your previous role commenting on Fed policy yeah. publicly, as you did at PIMCO in Columbia, yeah. you were part of discussions about the desirability of potentially the FOMC allowing some overshooting of the inflation target, whether it's to make up for past undershoots yeah. or for the sake of allowing the economy to run hot. Yeah. Um, how do you think about this possibility now that you're a member of the FOMC? I really take uh, a lot of wisdom and look hard at the academic literature, literature on this. It's a starting point, however. You know, the classic recent discussion of this is in Mike Woodford's textbook. Uh, some also theoretical work that I have done have, have, have talked about that. I, th I think in practice, uh, in those situations, uh, that is one tool to get an economy towards price stability. The economy now is operating at, at price stability, so that right now is not a relevant consideration uh, to me, because as at my first meeting, the, the, the Fed is actually at that price stability goal. Uh, but again, I'm aware of that theoretical uh, literature and, uh, and, and understand that, that argument, but I don't think that's relevant to me today. Well, let me just follow up on that. Mm -hmm. Roughly a year ago at our Rethinking Macro conference, Ben Bernanke presented his views about having a conditional price level yeah. target if you get near the zero lower bound, if you've been in a liquidity trap, or even if yeah. you don't want to call it that. Um, so some people like me would raise, well, we have the opposite time and consistency problem of what academics and modelers wrote about 30 years ago, which is central banks say they're going to promise to overshoot or average 2% inflation during the crisis. But then once the crisis is over, they renege and say, no, no, inflation's at target. We're not going to overshoot. Right. Am I missing something here? No, you're not. And, and indeed, that, that is an element of that literature that, that I just uh, referred to. Uh, and as I said, I'm, I'm certainly familiar with that, that literature. But, but right now, today, I don't think that's a relevant consideration for me. OK. Continuing yeah. in this notion of bridging from academic to real world, which, of course, you're uniquely positioned to do, how do you think about the tool of forward guidance that was the flavor du jour a couple of years ago? I mean, we all heard Chair Powell's remarks at Jackson Hole about not putting a little too much faith in the stars. Yeah. Um, what's your take on the Fed's experience and other central banks' experience using forward guidance? Let's talk about the Fed. So uh, the first episode of, of, of forward guidance, uh, explicit forward guidance by a Fed was really under Chairman Greenspan back in the 04 to 06 cycle when we had the measured pace uh, 
which was part of the statement and communicated to uh, financial markets under you know, very challenging circumstances after the global financial crisis, the Bernanke Fed used uh, some stronger forms of forward guidance, what folks like myself and other talking heads called calendar date right. guidance. Um, and, and then there was also a period when the Fed was, was making reference to macroeconomic thresholds, for example, unemployment. So, so I think that, there, that forward guidance as an instrument of policy uh, has been and can be an effective tool of policy. I think it becomes more and less relevant depending upon circumstances and, and likely depending upon how far away the central bank thinks it is uh, in terms of you know, it, its policy rate uh, process. Uh, but certainly, I think I, I do believe. Uh, apart, you know, I think someone once said that forward guidance, you know, maybe doesn't work in theory, but it works in practice. So I, I do think that forward guidance is um, uh, a tool that central banks can deploy. Other central banks as well. You're more of a scholar than I am, Adam. But as I read statements from the ECB and and Bank of J, they def BOJ, they definitely have that flavor uh, as well, given their current circumstances. So, Rich, moving. You're the top scholar on this stage, but moving from academics into practice. Yeah. In the latest round of announcements, we heard that you will be chairing a new committee of the FOMC specifically to look at communications. Yes. So it's obviously not just forward guidance or not even forward guidance. What's the remit of this committee? What can we look forward to you and your colleagues coming out with? The committee was just announced uh, at, at, at the September uh, uh, meeting, so it's early days. The, the committee is comprised of myself, Governor Lael Brainerd, Eric Rosengren, and Rob Kaplan from, from the Dallas Fed. And so uh, we are uh, really beginning the process now to uh, uh, assess the priorities that the committee should be focused on. So I don't have anything for you on that today, but maybe at a future visit to Peterson. Uh, well, I'd know. love to have a future visit. Mm -hmm. I, I don't mean to be obnoxious, but presumably there's some reason why you have the committee, right? The, the, the uh, communication subcommittee uh, has been uh, uh, in place at the Fed now uh, for, for some time. It takes on a range of issues. So early okay. committees took on the summary of economic projections or the consensus statement. So the mandate evolves as the Got circumstances it. evolve. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, so now really moving to the day to day. Yeah. I, I would be remiss, and I know you feel you would be remiss given recent events. What do you think of the market movements this month, this week, <laughs> last 24 hours? How should we think about that? as a monetary policy yeah. maker. Well, well I, I begin with the fundamentals of the economy, which as I said in my speech, I, I think are very, very solid. Rapid growth, strong labor market, inflation in line with the goal. So, so that's a positive. You know, that said, you know, changes in financial conditions are something that's relevant for the economic outlook and any central bank, if they are sustained, uh, needs to, to take into uh, account. So what it, said, what it says to me is that, as I indicated in my remarks, uh, you really want to continue to look at a wide range of, of real and macro and, and financial data to get a sense of where the economy is heading. And, and you know, financial right. conditions are one piece of that, but on a sustained uh, uh, basis. Right. And just to be clear, yeah. you're saying asset prices of varying sorts are indicators of financial conditions, not just futures on the treasury. Yeah, market. oh, absolutely. So broadly, yeah. OK. Um, more generally, mm -hmm. I mean, we know we have Randy Quarles as vice chair for supervision. I'm not going to ask you about supervision. But more generally, central banks around the world, including the Fed, are thinking about do they use what's called macro prudential tools? Yeah. And the macro piece of that word suggests that there's some interaction of those sure. measures with your monetary policy conditions. Yeah. Additionally, there are people who have said, I believe incorrectly, but others disagree, that moving the instrument interest rate is actually the way to get after some financial imbalances. And we know, even though we know that that is a concern that's been expressed by other members of the FOMC at various times right. recently. Yeah. So this is a very broad topic, but as the vice chair for monetary policy, how much do you think the Fed should be looking at some active measures, active policymaking 
with regard to financial imbalances as opposed or, or in addition to the mandates you've talked about? And how much should that be, be it countercyclical capital buffer or some theoretical other tool versus moving the interest rate? Very important question, and I think that one of the things that I've come to conclude after looking at it as an academic and market observer uh, um, is macroprudential is, is, is very important, but I think there are good reasons to believe that it's, it's probably very country specific. That mm -hmm. is the macroprudential tools that might work in the UK or continental Europe or the Nordics might not work in the US. One, one reason for that obviously is differences in our credit markets. Right. You know, something like 80% of US credit is intermediated outside of the banking sector, whereas in Europe about 80% of credit is. And so I think that the tools that, that could be potentially effective in the US uh, may differ from the tools that work in, in other countries. I come into this uh, with, a, with a view that as a sort of a, a general starting point, I would think that you know, using monetary policy instrument uh, is a pretty blunt instrument in a lot of cases. I think that's a term not unique uh, to me, uh, but it is an important it is an important uh, uh, issue, um, and it's certainly something that you know I'm I'm studying, and, and obviously the Fed is looking into um, uh, intensely. But but I think the challenge, as I've said, is we just don't have a lot of experience with macro prudential, certainly in the U.S. And whatever experiences other countries have had, perhaps may not be that relevant. So it's an important issue, but. But, but at least as far as I'm concerned, um, uh, there's still a lot to learn about it. Yeah, and I, I would just point out that it's absolutely, as you say, Rich, it depends very much on the nature of the mortgage market, the credit market, but also there's governance issues. At Bank of England, where I was, they consciously, the government set up two separate committees to deal with financial stability and monetary policy, right. or financial policy. In the US, it's obviously one joint FOMC that makes all the decisions. Yeah. Um, do you see a role for someday specifying some guidelines on how these get coordinated, or is that just an impossible fool's errand? I, I guess I wouldn't say it's an impossible fool's errand. I'm sit sitting here today. I don't have anything concrete right. for you. I'm no, no, no. Not because it's unimportant. It's very important. Right. No, no, it's but it's just yeah, it's yeah, not yeah, evident. Yeah, yeah. No, that's cool. Yeah. Um, let me continue the sort of monetary policy recent history tour because, yeah. of course, you've been an observer and an academic researcher as well as now a policymaker. Um, looking back since 2008, the Fed, the Bank of Japan, the ECB, the Bank of England, but obviously most importantly the Fed for this purpose, did engage in what's been called quantitative easing. There's been a number of studies coming out, our friends across the street under David Wessel, did an event reflecting on this recently. Yeah. My colleague at the Peterson Institute, Joe Gagnon, and former Fed official Brian Sack, another former, just did a recent paper. I think it's called A User's Guide to QE that's getting a lot of notice. Not, not so much asking you to evaluate anybody else's work, but based on your reading yeah. of the evidence, yeah. where is QE now? How should we have looked at its successes or failures? Is it dangerous? Is it something you want to keep in the toolkit? Yeah. So, so my thinking on that, and I, I said so at the time, and I haven't changed my mind, is that um, uh, QE, uh, especially the earlier rounds of QE, uh, were justified and, and, and were effective. I've also come to believe and have written that, as, and I think Chair Bernanke himself used this terminology, which I agree with, like anything in economics, there are, there are benefits and costs, and I'm of the general view that the various rounds of QE over time, that, that the, the benefits were diminishing and the potential costs were, were going up, uh, but it's certainly something that I would not want to rule out of the, of, of the toolkit. Could you just say a bit more about what you see as the potential costs were, um, did you mention? I mean, the benefits, I think, are, are you can disagree about the empirical size, but we also yeah. have to understand what they were, their stimulative monetary policy. So what were the costs in your view? Well, I think that there, the, there, there is a potential cost in terms of selecting potential assets to buy, right? So it's not a treasury only right. portfolio. And, and as a consequence, that is, the intent was to change the rates of return and the prices of those right. assets. And in general, I'm, 
I'm uncomfortable with mon monetary authorities getting into that side, but again, not critical of the decision as it was made in, in, in 08. Um, you know, I think that I think they're potentially, you know, certainly diminishing uh, uh, returns. And I think, although I haven't seen Joe's recent paper, I think there's some evidence uh, of that uh, as um, uh, as uh, as well. So I think that that would be the the, the ones that I would point to. Thank you. Um, we are the Peterson Institute for International yeah. Economics. International economics. Um, you have a very distinguished career writing about and looking at things well beyond the US. Yeah. Um, so let me turn for a minute to the international side. Good. Um, as you said, the Fed's mandate has to do with US inflation and employment goals, US financial yeah. stability. But as you also said, um, global developments matter to achieving those goals. Absolutely. So as the Fed moves forward, how should it be thinking about such important matters as international capital flows and how they get driven by the Fed's interest rate differentials versus others, but also structural factors. I mean, we all remember Chairman Bernanke's, then Chairman Bernanke's speech about the savings club. Yeah. And there is still a very global imbalance of our savings versus other people's savings. How does this affect what you think about monetary policy conduct? Well, there are a lot of dimensions to it. I'll focus on, on one or two. I, I think as a general um, proposition, it's important uh, to run a forward-looking monetary policy. And so when you're, when you're evaluating your instruments in terms of your goals, you have to factor in how the rest of the world is impacting a lot of parts of the economy. Your, you know, your, your trade, your, your exports, your capital inflows, because the dollar's reserve currency developments abroad impact the entire constellation of our yields and, and returns. Um, and so that's a very important consideration in terms of doing a good outlook or forecast for the uh, uh, economy. So I think primarily that's the way I think about the way the international data impacts the way that I that I think about uh, that I think about policy. I think that it's important that the goals of the Fed are to achieve low and stable inflation and full employment. And I think on average, if the Fed achieves that, that's that's a positive for the global economy as right. as well. I, I am choosing uh, not to come in here and say, well, what about the poor emerging markets who are disabled yeah. by Fed rate hikes because we know the Fed cannot officially care about that. Um, it can feel the pain. But, but can I ask you just a little bit more on this? Sure, yeah. So in terms of affecting the U.S. forecast, right? So you've got right now arguably one of the most, leave aside the politics, obviously. You have one of the most challenging international forecasts. We have a dollar that's been rising and looks set to continue to rise, but who knows. Yeah. We have tariffs. Again, whether or not you like them, they are a reality. Mm -hmm. You can read the stuff on our website and you should not like them, but <laughs> we'll leave that aside. <laughs> yeah. um, which obviously has some price effects, some employment yeah. effects. You have arguably new or at least increased forms of geopolitical risk around the world. Yeah. Again, I'm not asking you to comment directly on any of yeah. these, but do you feel that these are factors that are in, we're in new territory? Do you feel the U.S. is still largely a more closed economy, larger economy than others, and these are secondary factors? Just more generally, how should we be thinking about these as we move ahead? Well, cer certainly, you know, relative to, d to decades ago when I started my career, the U.S. is a more open economy than, than it was. And as I said, in some ways, financially very open because of the interconnectedness of global right. financial markets. So I think that is a reality, um, Adam. I guess what I would say, as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, you, 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 you spotted some potential issues in the global economy, but, but certainly, as I said, I do believe policy today remains accommodative. Um, and I think I would also mention in this regard that I think Fed communication is, is important uh, as as well, and so uh, as I said, you know, the global factors enter as I as I as I indicated. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, yeah. but that would seem to imply, by omission, that the current account deficit of the U.S. 
rising and expanding is not of direct concern to the Federal Reserve? Well, I think you look, you, you certainly want to look at the capital flows uh, into the uh, into the U.S. And obviously, you know, the, as I've written, as I'm sure you understand, yes. the current account is a global general equilibrium yes. phenomenon, so it needs to be understood in that context. And therefore, bilateral current account deficits mm -hmm. are particularly not worth focusing on. Just a <laughs> note. Um, staying in the international sphere for another yeah. moment. Yeah. Um, when we look back at the global financial crisis, a number of commentators, myself included, but also people far, with far better chops, have pointed out that the swap lines, the dollar swap lines the Federal Reserve made available to other central banks were extremely effective in stopping the panic and, and seemed to work very well. Um, you have seen this from both the market perspective and the policy perspective. This is obviously not an issue of today. But right. look, again, just as we went through QE and other tools and forward guidance, what are your reflections on the use of the swap lines that the Fed undertook during the global financial yeah. crisis? Well, as I look back at that program, what, what, what strikes me is that, is that the goal of putting the swap lines in place was this contagion from the global dollar funding markets into the US. And so again, even though these were swap lines set up with foreign central banks, the initial objective was to attenuate or try to insulate the global spillovers into the US uh, dollar funding markets. I think that, that, I think that was goal. And I think the studies that have looked at that program indicate that it, that it was successful. Of course, if, as you know, Adam, but just for the folks in the, in the audience, that program is structured so that the the Fed is facing other central banks as counterparties, not, not individual borrowers uh, 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 directly. And there's, no, and, and there's also structure that there's no currency risk. So it was a pure provision of liquidity in a situation of duress. And I, and I think the studies indicate that it was effective. Very good. Um, finally, you've been admirably concise and clear, um, which is a wonderful thing for a central banker to be as opposed to when you and I were growing up and the goal was to be discursive and therefore unclear. Um, <laughs> so thank you for that. You're welcome. I'm going to I think. <laughs> well, so now I'm going to have to ask you for another clear statement. Yeah. Um, President Trump has uh, had a lot to say in public lately about his apparent displeasure with the Fed removing accommodation. Um, he's tweeted this. He said this in the Wall Street Journal interview. Um, some consider this an attack on the Federal Reserve's independence in setting monetary policy. I, as a student of this, know it's at least in terms of public comments pretty unprecedented for the last few decades mm -hmm. um, from a US president. How? thinking about Fed communications as well as yeah. policy. How does the Fed react to this kind of new pressure from the outside? Well, Adam, let me tell you the way that, that I think, think about it. As a student of monetary policy, I, I know that history indicates that central bank independence is important in order to achieve objectives given to central banks. The Fed's mandate is given to it by Congress price stability and maximum employment, and, and the Fed has a degree of independence in running the policies that over time can best serve to achieve those uh, objectives. And I think, that, I think that's very important. I think that the Fed is and will continue to be very transparent and accountable about why we're implementing the policies we are to achieve those goals. Uh, and I have every intention of, of continuing uh, to do that, as I'm sure all of my colleagues uh, will as well. Um, you and I, when we first met, uh, you were very gracious to me. I had just started as a Federal Reserve, as an economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. You were already a distinguished professor at Columbia. Um, we were both working on studies of what was then a very important central bank, the Bundesbank. Yeah. And so we're familiar with a central bank that has at times gotten very tetchy about perceived uh, incursions on its independence. And we've seen what's happened with the ECB. Um, I don't obviously ask you to ask, talk any more about foreign central banks. But there are people who worry that 
looking back at what happened with the ECB, that one possible outcome of public pressure on an independent central bank is the central bank would be reluctant to pause in hiking or reluctant to cut rates when circumstances warrant because they don't want to look like they're caving into political pressure. Can you reassure us? It will, it will in no way be a consideration as far as I'm concerned. We have a very clear mandate. Uh, the data shows up every month in terms of inflation and unemployment. And our job is to sustain what is a very healthy and robust economy right now. And that's what I'm going to do. I have no doubt that that is what you're going to do. We are both honored but also enlightened to have had you with us today. Thank you very much, Vice Chairman Clarida. Thank you. Adam. Thank you all. If you missed any of this event, you can find it on our website, C-SPAN.